my name is Debbie Montgomery Johnson, and I am the founder of the nonprofit, The Woman Behind the Smile. I'm also the author of the book, The Woman Behind the Smile, Triumph Over the Online, Ultimate Online Dating Betrayal. There we go. Do you can see it? This is a fun video. Today, I'm answering a couple of questions that people have posed to me over the years, such as, how in the world could you have been scammed for over a million dollars? That's a question I've asked myself many times, but I've stopped beating myself up because over the years, I've found that there's so much out there that we don't know about the scamming world and the scammers are way ahead of us technologically and they know how to get your heart to open up your wallet. It doesn't seem possible when you're thinking, how in the world could a woman that was trained like you, how could an Air Force intelligence officer, how could a senior bank manager, how in the world could a paralegal, how in the world could someone like you, well-trained, well-educated, be duped by an online romance? Well, I've got to tell you, it was a perfect storm. When my husband passed away, I was vulnerable. I was alone. I was trying to be self-sufficient, and I put up my smile and I hid behind it because I thought the world needed to see me as self-sufficient and self-reliant. It doesn't work. I tried my best and I got taken big time, as do millions, billions of people around the world for a lot of money. The next audio that you're going to hear is an interview that I did with Scammer Stories. And it tells how things happen because my book is a short version of a 4,000 page journal that I have. It doesn't describe everything. I just want you to be aware of how these things happen. My slogan, be aware and beware, or beware and be aware, is here to educate you on what to look out for and to watch your family members, your friends, your, your grandparents, your parents, Watch for the warning signs, the pink flags that I always say. Watch for those pink flags, red flags, yellow flags, those things that might show a scammer is getting involved in your life or in their lives. I encourage you to listen to this next section and pass it on. It's a warning sign from me to you. I will always be the woman with a smile, but I don't want to be the woman behind the smile anymore. Thank you so much. On this episode of Scammer Stories, Debbie Montgomery lost a lot of money, more than some of us will even see in our lifetime. We're talking more than a million dollars in a two-year period. I really hid from what had happened because I was just so embarrassed. Like so many others, she just lost her husband and was thrust into a role she didn't expect. I got angry at Lou for dying. I got sad. I was lonely. And Debbie is no dummy. I had been a senior manager for World Savings and Wachovia Bank. I had been an Air Force Intel officer. I had been a paralegal. I mean, I had a lot of training. Still, she didn't realize the nightmare that was about to begin in 2010 and how her life would forever change. Amazingly, she came out better, stronger, happier. You may even recognize Debbie's name. She's a business owner and author, and now a pioneer and advocate who has recently appeared on Dr. Oz, The Tamron Hall Show, and The Mel Robbins Show. We'll talk about that a little later. First, let's back up to nine years ago when all of a sudden her husband died. At the time, she was a treasurer for the school district. So on top of trying to deal with the loss of her husband of 26 years, she suddenly had to learn how to run his company. Yeah, I was literally working 18, 20 hours a day between my job and the company. Concerned friends told her to get a life, maybe try online dating. Debbie tried a faith-based site, thinking it would be safe. So I went online and did the online dating. Unless you actually hear about it, you'd never believe that someone took you for a ride like this. Okay, so what was his story? The online profile was that he was a British businessman, widower. Like so many other stories, he claimed to have a child. The fake boy was 10 years old, named Kenny. He also weaved another so-called family member into his scheme. His sister Mary was in England with Kenny because Eric traveled. His business was hardwood trees. He was brokering hardwood trees, which was interesting because at the time I owned trees in Costa Rica as an investment, which he didn't know about. So when he contacted me, he was supposed to be in Houston. 
And then uh, he got a job in Malaysia moving a lot of trees over to India. I thought it was kind of cool what he was doing. I did check out the website and the website looked good. When I called and said, do you have a contractor named Eric Cole? The people there said, well, no, not really. And I thought, well, perhaps because he's a contractor, they don't really have everybody listed. And that I was in a vulnerable situation after Lou had died. What Debbie says next really hits home with me. I've been searching for answers on why my mother is addicted to scammers. Even after she ended up with no place to live and penniless, no one has put it quite like this. And I want everyone to hear it. So listen closely to what happens after you lose a spouse and start talking to someone online. The adrenaline and the endorphins and all the excitement. I always laugh when the Yahoo chat, there was a little ding, ding, ding type of a thing. When that went off, I mean, I could be in a dead sleep in my bedroom, hear that go off in my office and go running across the house to get online to chat with him. It made me feel so good. It was hard to start dating after, you know, after Lou died because I hadn't, I mean, we've been married 26 years and I tell folks all the anxiety of when you're young in dating for the first time, all that came out that, you know, here I am now 52, not 16, but am I smart enough, pretty enough, skinny enough, all those enough come up, you know, and you got to put yourself out there online. It was a scary thing. And so when, when we connected, it was, he, he knew what to say and when to say it. And he was very well versed at what he was doing. The first time he asked you for money, how did that start? That was really pretty simple. A few weeks in and, and one of his friends was an engineer again, overseas, and he was having trouble getting onto the dating site. And so Eric said, hey, would you mind sending in, I think I sent in a check for 45 or 50 bucks to the dating site to get his friend on. But that's how it started. It was little. That was kind of the test, I guess, looking back to see if I'd be willing to do that because the next amount of money was substantially higher. It was about $2,500 that we were getting a power of attorney. Because the whole story was, as he was finishing up this job over there, he was supposed to be done by Christmas and was coming here to the States to have Christmas with me. And so he wasn't going to get paid until the end. And I understand too with business that sometimes you don't get paid till your job's finished. So that's where the idea of maybe him not having all the funds that he needed was understandable to me because he was waiting to get paid. And so we were setting up bank accounts and things, and he ne- he needed to power attorney. And so he, I got to know his lawyer. One of the characters in the story was Peter, and Peter was an attorney, and Peter was from London. And I communicated with Peter, and uh, every now and then through the two years, if something happened to Eric, then Peter would contact me. But it was like I had all these different characters that I was writing through at the same time. And I, if I were to you know be a fly on the wall somewhere, I'd want to know how these guys did it. People say, hey, were there any red flags? I kind of qualify them as pink, where I asked questions. And then when I didn't get the answer that should have given me an idea that maybe we weren't dealing with the truth here. Whenever I asked him, he always had a good rational answer for why. You talked to him on the phone, didn't you? Just a couple times. Yeah, not a lot. It really wasn't like today where you're texting and talking and all that kind of stuff. But when I did talk to him, he did have a British accent, which played right into the story. Of course, I didn't think that Nigerians had British accents, but they do too. (laughs) But again, I wasn't anticipating him being other than who he was. And so he was 55. He had his PhD. He was well versed. He wrote well, which was extraordinary for me because most of the guys that I had met online couldn't write a fifth grade sentence and their pictures were horrible. So he presented well, he sounded good, he wrote well. He did move off of the website rather quickly because he said traveling, it would be easier to get onto Yahoo Chat, which was for me cool because it was like instant messaging and we would get on and write for hours. It was amazing. Eric came up with a story similar to Debbie's, hoping to reel her in with his compassion. Eric became Debbie's emotional support and confidant. His wife had been from Ireland and she was killed in an accident. We were able to talk about these things. I talked about my husband dying and he talked about his wife dying. And those things were things we had in common and it was very therapeutic actually for me to put my heart out there and you know I could tell him everything about the kids and about my life about the frustrations I was having he and I would talk about business because he was a businessman he wanted to know you know about certain things so we discussed everything I copied and pasted every message that we had between each other and I have 4,000 pages of journal printed in books but it was an extraordinary story 
At the time, Debbie thought that making a book of the beginning of their love affair would be something the couple could cherish forever. It turned out to be evidence that she handed over to the FBI. Like other cases, it went nowhere. Even with the million-dollar loss, the FBI, remember, doesn't have jurisdiction overseas. When they said that they couldn't help me, I just basically said, I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm going to pretend like it never happened. And if anybody asks me why we're not together, I'm just going to say it just didn't work out. Well, that was good for about a year. And then I was uh, at a speaker training in Fort Lauderdale with a bunch of my girlfriends. And one of them at lunch said something about online dating. And I rolled my eyes at her and she said, okay, what is that story about? And so I told her and she said, Deb, you have to tell that story. And of course I said, absolutely not. I will not. She goes, you have to tell your story because my mom was taken for 80,000. And then another girl came up and she said, I was taken by a guy in person. We've been together for a year and it turned out he had another family. And then someone else had been in a Ponzi scheme and all of these things. And they all hid behind their stories. And they said, you need to speak up. Debbie went home and started writing her heart out. And within six months, I had my book written. And that's when I basically started my mission of getting the word out about online dating scams because I had never heard of it. You may be wondering how Debbie can sound so upbeat after what happened to her. She says it's what the scumbag did after she gave him the money. One of the big reasons I was able to separate what happened from my life is because he actually came on and confessed. And he came on live for the first time in two years. And I saw him. And... At that instant that I saw him, it was not this handsome Brit that I thought I had fallen in love with. It was a young Nigerian guy with a big smile on his face and wanted to know if we could keep it going. And of course, I'm like, are you out of your mind? But most of the women that this has happened to, there's no closure because the guy basically drops off the face of the earth. And you think that he's died or you think that something has happened or that you did something wrong. And it makes you so susceptible for being scammed again. I mean, most victims are taken two or three times. I have a friend here that she lost or gave away about 600000 lost her home, was working with me in an organization in Miami called SCARS. She had gone on TV. She'd done a you know broadcast for ABC. And we thought she was well on her way to recovery. And the next thing I know, I get a call from the organization in Miami saying, hey, her banking information is showing up. A scammer had given it to another victim. What's going on? And it turns out that she got lured in. We thought that this scammer was trying to get her to be a mule, which is the next iteration of being scammed where you're actually being used by the scammers to be a go-between with money from other women. So it gets sent to you and then you send it on. And I called her on it and actually turned her into law enforcement and they didn't do anything. But I was just like, you know, how, how could that have happened? We are so close. Why didn't you call me? And she said, well, I just felt like this guy was for real. He was an attorney in Miami. And I was like, oh my gosh. So it does happen. Unlike many victims or survivors, the term Debbie prefers, she was able to move on and find love again. She did go back online, but met her current husband through a friend. Debbie says she told him on the second date after he admitted he had something to tell her from his past. Now, he supports her speaking out. I am a little bit different because I have remarried and I have a very supportive husband who wants me to get out and about. I have gone very vocal on this, very public on this, because I feel it's my mission that happened to me for a reason and I'm going to make something good out of it. And so by speaking up, if one person can hear what happened to me, then I hope they'll either not engage in what I did or realize that they've been taken too and there is help. There are other really bright, intelligent, well-trained women that this has happened to. They're not alone, but there is a way out. Hey, Scammer Warriors. The sponsor of this episode is pretty cool. It's called Best Fiends, and I think it's right up your alley. Here's what you do. Take a quick break from searching for scammers for something a little lighter, a little bit more fun. I like this game because you don't have to read the instructions first. It's that easy. And you move up quickly. Oh, the feeling of busting those slugs. I like to play while standing in line at the store. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. There's a great website called romancescamsnow.com and anyscam.com. And they're run by the organization that I'm on the board of in Miami. There is great information there. 
A lot of the online websites and Facebook groups put up pictures of men and women used as fronts for scammers and the real scammers' photos. But Debbie pointed out something that never crossed my mind. I have found that for me, it's like looking at mugshots. It's not a positive thing for me. And my guy, I know what he looks like. So as far as I'm concerned, all scammers look like him. When speaking to advocates and survivors like Debbie, they often share ideas of how to fix the problem. I really like this one. Will it happen? No, because it could eat into profits for online dating sites, but it would be effective. She thinks the websites should add a disclaimer, and not in the tiny writing at the bottom of the screen, a video right up front before anyone can get on. It doesn't matter what website it's on. The problem I have with all of them is I don't think they do a good enough job in alerting their subscribers. They need to put it out there because we are so trusting. You know, you hear about the Yahoo boys and the groups of six to eight, and I'm wondering if that's really what it was like there. But it was extraordinary. After the confession, I really wanted to know why he did it and how he did it and how he could keep up the story. And I'm thinking that there was probably much of his story was his real life. I believe, you know, his parents were probably dead. He probably had siblings he was taking care of. I mean, that was the whole basis for the confession at the end. Because he knew that I could turn him in and that I could have him arrested, or at least he thought that I could possibly do that. And he seemed to be concerned about his siblings. If that's true or not, I don't know. But there's so much about the story that he couldn't have lied about everything because you can't remember two years worth of lies. Would have caught him at some point. But that shows me how good they are. And so why did he want to keep it going? Did he want you to be a money mule? No, he didn't. You know, it's it's interesting because why did he confess? I mean, 99% of the guys aren't going to confess. And I asked him, I said, why, why did you do this? You know, why did you confess in, in the first place? And he basically said that he had gotten, he had feelings for me at that point. And he wanted us to continue, not the money, but us. And I was like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> And and he literally said, is it because I'm young and black? And I'm thinking, well, maybe, but no, you lied for two years and you took over a million dollars. He apologized. He said, I will try to get some of that back to you. And I'm thinking, okay, so when? And, you know, restitution is part of this whole thing. And he said, someday I will. And I'm like, I'm not holding my breath. And I doubt I'll ever see it from him uh, because he didn't get it all. You know, that, that million dollars went around the world. He, he, I'm sure, got some of it, but not a lot. But a little to a Nigerian would be a lot for him. You know, the economics of the whole thing. Because I asked him, I said, why do you boys do this? Why, why is this happening? And, it's, and he, it's basically economics. Because they found something that they're good at. They found that they can make a lot of money out of it. And it's safe because they're not anywhere near the victims. Except okay. for now. You know, now now the EFCC, out the economic group over there, are they, they are going after these kids. And if they can find them, they are arresting them. But there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of these guys out there and billions of dollars being taken from unsuspecting men and women around the world. If he was here in the States, they could go after him, which is what's happening because some of the scammers are actually coming here and they're in the United States. And if they get caught here, they're going to get prosecuted here. But over there, no, we can only rely on the Nigerians going after them. And in the past, they haven't done that, but they've had more success in the last year or two. That's why the scammers are moving to Ghana or moving to other countries. And they're all over the world, but primarily the online dating scammers have been in Nigeria. I watched your segment on the Tamron Hall show, and I noticed at a couple points during the interview, the gasp from the audience. And I'm sure you're used to that, aren't you? Well, (laughs) Yes and no, because when I hear it, I know what they're thinking. And I want to just say, you know, let me explain. <laughs> this is why it happened. It was funny because of all the shows, she says she wasn't judgmental, but it sure did sound like there's some judgment going on there. It definitely sounded like it to me. I know she was genuinely trying. I didn't take it personally because, you know, to most people, it does seem unbelievable that it happens. But honestly, I bet there's at least one person in that audience that it had happened to, or they knew somebody that it had happened to. And that's what we do. And this organization I work with down in Miami, I'm probably going to be taking on a bigger role in February. I want women around the world, men too, but you know, I feel for the women. I want them to know that this is happening and this is how they do it. And if it's happened to you, you got to understand you're not going to get your money back, but 
there is a way for you to move forward and not let it happen again. And I want to give them hope because most of them will shut down emotionally, spiritually, financially, everything. They're on the verge of suicide. They're in the midst of depression. They can't see in front of their noses how to get out of it. And they'll never love again because their heart is so closed up. And that's sad. I don't want to see that. Like I said, I've remarried. Darling man, love him to death. And I met him months after I got scammed. Now, how in the world I you know, put myself out there within months? I don't know. But I did go back online within like months after this happened. But I'm not against online dating. I just want you to be careful and to realize that every social media outlet that there is, there are scammers, you know, be it LinkedIn. I mean, when I was on Mel Robbins, there was a millennial, a 20 something, and she'd been taken on one of the apps. This guy had social engineered like this thing about 300 girls ended up sending him nude photos of themselves. And I'm thinking, oh, I only gave money away. I didn't give him any pictures of me, you know? But it's the 50 and up, it's the millennials, it's the younger girls. That's what I worry about is the teenagers whose pictures are out there everywhere, who, you know, are letting everybody know that they're playing lacrosse at three o'clock at Park Vista High School. And this is what I look like. And down here in Florida, everywhere, but down here, it's very sensitive, the trafficking of youth. I'm thinking, we have to take this seriously. The money that was taken by online dating for women like me, that money could be used for Boko Haram. It could be used for terrorism. It could be used for all these awful things. You know, and if anybody ever realized that, of course, we would never send a dime. I mean, my mission is to save people like your mom and like my friends. I had a girlfriend call up a couple of weeks ago and she said, Deb, I don't know what to do. My neighbor just called me and asked me to come over and help her take a picture of her credit card so she could send it to her buddy. I'm like, what? Down here, you know, we have a lot of older folks. They get a little bit of mental lapse and they're thinking they've got these online buddies and the scammers are so good. There's somebody else out there that's going through the same thing, thinking they're alone. When a woman that's gone through this, here's my story. She immediately feels like she has a friend because I get it. I know what she went through and I can talk her down off that ledge or I can give her hope because I can say this has happened to me. And you'll get so empowered and you'll get your power back. You know, you take the power away from the scammer when you can stand up for yourself and say, yep, it happened. I'm not going to do it again. Who can I help? It's huge. Someone's got to talk about the online scam and it's turned out to be me and that's fine. I hope to do it in a bigger way uh, after February with scars. But in the meantime, I'm doing what I can. I'm so willing to speak to anybody and everybody about it because I don't want anybody else hurt. Romance scam victims are where I think domestic violence victims might have been 30, 40 years ago. When you walked in back then and you know you were beaten up, they're like, be nicer to your husband. Today, you walk in and you're beat up, they go arrest the guy. So when we walk in, all you're going in for is informational purposes, to get an informational report so that you can go. There are programs in the state where you might be able to get rent assistance. You might be able able to get therapy assistance. There are things that as a victim in the state, especially in Florida, you can qualify for these things, but you have to have a police report. I didn't know that. That's something we need to to bring out in a bigger way. But again, that's the band-aid after the fact. The biggest thing is prevention before it happens. Debbie now has a wonderful life in South Florida and a loving husband. She's still running the company. She also travels to speak on business. Right now she's in India. Her book about her romance scam is called The Woman Behind the Smile. I needed this interview with Debbie. The way she described her excitement every time she talked to her scammer. And that's what my mother is going through right now. I needed to hear her perspective. It really helps me understand. And I hope her perspective helps others understand too. Until next time, scammer warriors.